I, do you know, I'm just... Oh, it's very worrying, isn't it? <laughs> you get old. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Wigtown Book Festival. It's lovely to see so many of you here this morning. Welcome also to the people joining us um, via the online event. Um, it's really lovely to join you all today. Um, and to, I will do a formal introduction in a minute, but to obviously I'm going to really enjoy introducing you to the lady on my right, who is Suzanne O'Sullivan. Just before I get into that, just a little uh, chat about how this event is going to run. Um, Suzanne and I are going to have a conversation um, about her new book, which is The Sleeping Beauties. I will be flashing this around at various points during the course of the event. Um, and then we will have uh, ample time for questions from the audience at the end, and we'll also be able to take questions um, from the wider internet audience. Um, if you stick them into the chat, we will see them and be able to... Uh, I will read them out so that it can be heard. Um, there will be a book signing at the end, of which more when we get to the end of the event. Um, and if anyone needs the loo, it's just off to my right, your left, through that door. Um, <laughs> without any further ado, um, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Suzanne O'Sullivan. Suzanne is an Irish neuro neurologist. Uh, she graduated from Trinity College, Dublin. She's currently consultant neurologist at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery in London. Her first book, It's All in Your Head, was published in 2015 and won the 2016 Welcome Book Prize and the Royal Society of Biology Prize. Her second book brain, was Brainstorm, Detective Stories from the World of Neurology. And her third book <laughs> <laughs> is The Sleeping Beauties. Um, she also holds, because she's not accomplished enough, apparently, <laughs> she also holds an MA in Creative Writing from Birkbeck College in London and was the AITO Travel Writer of the Year in 2018. Um, Sleeping Beauties has just been shortlisted for the Royal Society Book Prize. It's a fascinating book about an endlessly interesting topic. Will you all join me in giving Suzanne O'Sullivan a really warm welcome, please? Thank you. <laughs> so nice. Oh, it's so nice to hear people in the room. It's such a joy, isn't yeah. it, to be with people That's and to be, to be able to see your faces. I know, I'm so, so relieved. Or at least be a part of your faces. Yes. Yeah, it's <laughs> part of your faces. We'll settle for that, I'm sure. <laughs> if you could all smile with really crinkly eyes during <laughs> yeah, this event, that would exactly. be much appreciated. Um, I thought we could start with uh, sort of asking you just a little bit about what the book's about yep. and how you came to get interested in the subject. Sure. So, I mean, sort of the bigger background of how, why I was interested is I'm a neurologist. Um, I'm trained to deal specifically with things like epilepsy, comas, blackouts, things like that. So brain diseases. But at least a third of people who go to seizure clinics believing they have epilepsy or, or a brain disease like that actually are having blackouts and memory lapses for purely psychological reasons for a variety of different mechanisms. So it's something neurologists encounter all the time. And so in my job, I became interested in a sort of psychological underpinnings of um, how one can get physical symptoms in the absence of disease. Um, I know, I've known for a long time that when the media writes about this concept, symptoms that often have a psychological cause, they very often list it as a mystery illness. Um, I think there's a real discomfort with people talking about sort of how the mind and body interact and people are sort of nervous about it. So whenever I see a newspaper headline that says, mystery illness strikes town or something, I, I always think, I bet that's something related to what I do. And I, a couple of years ago, I saw one of those headlines. It said, Sweden's mystery illness. And it was about a group of children, all from asylum-seeking families who live in Sweden, who are all seeking asylum in Sweden, but from a variety of countries. And these children had fallen into this sort of mystery coma-like state, so they become sort of catatonic. When I read the story, they had a great deal in common with my own patients, who also have these sort of blackouts and comas that are, are not explained by brain disease, but they were also different. And they were different in the sense that, you know, my patients lose consciousness for minutes, hours. I've seen people lose consciousness for days or weeks with these reasons, for these same reason. But these children were in this comatose state for months or years. So they gradually withdrew from society, um, just became more and more apathetic. They lie in their beds, 
and they close their eyes and they just stop communicating. They don't eat, they don't open their eyes, they don't move at all, these children, and they're kept alive by their parents with tube feeding and physiotherapy and so forth. And I read about this and I thought, well, I mean, it, it is pretty astonishing. How, how, what aspect of the brain or mind can co possibly keep one in a comatose state for that long in the absence of disease? So I visited them. Um, with the help of a doctor who supports them. And it was a really shocking visit. It was sort of, um, you know, I met these two little girls who were just, one of them in particular, she was 10 years old. She was just like a little rag doll in her bed. You know, I walked into the room with, room with a group of other people and a dog, and she didn't, she didn't flicker an, eye, uh, um, an eyelid or anything. And her father picked her up and she was literally floppy like a rag doll. And she'd been like that for a year and a half. And but one particular thing really disturbed me during this visit. I was clearly disturbed by what was obviously upsetting, which was these young, two young children who were very sick and had been so for a long time, not getting any treatment. But the thing that disturbed me that I wasn't expecting was that everyone kept saying to me as a neurologist, you know, what's happening in their brains? What's happening in their brains to cause this problem? The truth was that everybody knew what was wrong with these children. Basically, they're all seeking asylum. They'd all come from places like Syria. They'd all come from persecuted minorities. They'd fled to Sweden, and they went into this state called resignation syndrome when they were, were facing possible deportation from Sweden. So it was absolutely obvious that, you know, the problem here was if it only affects asylum-seeking children in a very specific situation, in a very specific community, clearly what's happening in the brain is very interesting, but the problem that needs to be solved is a social problem. And that sort of kind of, as soon as I raise that with the people, I'm sure that Philip is thinking, is the time no, nearly up? Yeah. She talks a lot. I do talk a lot. This is a shared <laughs> joy. <laughs> I'm nearly at the, I've nearly got to the point. Uh, so basically, you know, but what then bothered me was I kind of said to the doctors I was visiting with, you know, but... Um, Surely, you know, the pro you solve the social problem. They wouldn't even let me talk about that. And I understood why, because the minute you start talking about the social aspect of illness, it's like you're diminishing the, the person's suffering in people's eyes. You know, talking about brain mechanisms and diseases emphasizes suffering. But if you try and talk about social, so, psychosocial aspects of diseases, people think you're saying, oh, well, it's, they're not really ill, or it's, it's not as serious if I, if I couch it this way. Um, and that sort of set me on a bit of a mission, to be honest, to sort of try and open up this conversation about, you know, how our, our minds and bodies interact and how it's okay to sort of recognize those interactions and it doesn't make the physical suffering any less. And that led me to visit other communities with strange illnesses that just involved their community, often referred to as things like mass hysteria. So I sort of... Um, it's. People may think it's unusual, but actually at any point in time, you can find a community somewhere in the world struck down by what's called mass hysteria. So mass physical symptoms that can't be explained by disease contained within a single community. So there was a town in Kazakhstan where 133 people fell asleep for no reason. Mystery illness strikes Kazakhstan. Um, you know, towns in South America where a thousand girls were having seizures and it's um, it's any kind of community, upstate New York, where a group of girls were getting, having tics and seizure-like episodes. So I started sort of visiting these communities and trying to sort of understand the phenomenon of how society creates outbreaks like this, but also kind of talk about it a bit more openly. Mm. The, the stories are absolutely fascinating. One of the things that really... Um, stood out for me was your discussion of the language that we use and what you've mm. just touched on, people's um, real rejection, almost, of, yeah. of diagnoses. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that sort of sense of this, this, if something is caused or seen to be caused in the brain, mm. it's a choice mm. that you can yeah. snap out of it. Yeah. You talked in the, the case of the um, American... Um, diplomats in yeah. Cuba of, of yeah. people emphasizing that they were not malingerers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, the minute we start talking about mind-body interactions, people immediately start thinking, cannot distinguish, you know, the, um, the physical symptoms that arise for, for psychosocial reasons. A lot of people have a great deal of difficulty appreciating that these are real, out of our control, and as disabling as any other condition. But 
And I think there's a few different reasons. There's a lot of historical hangovers, sort of, you know, I'm quite a fan of a lot of things Freud wrote, but he also suggested that every time anyone has any of these sort of psychosomatic conditions, they must have suffered an awful psychological trauma. A lot of misconceptions like that make these things hard for people to relate to. But um, I'm going to briefly tell the story of Havana in a second. But first, I want to just point out to you how easy it is for you to control of your, lose control of your body, even though you're perfectly well and you've suffered no psychological trauma. So if, if anybody starts paying attention to movements, movements are supposed to be unconsciously controlled. You've been learning walking your whole life so that you can do it without thinking. And um, particularly when you're younger and you've never suffered an illness, you just, you walk, you move around, you do everything without thinking and it's seamless and easy. But if anything ever happens to draw attention to your movements, it completely changes the quality of it. So think about walking along a, a, a narrow pathway, you know, somewhere in Wigtown. You just do that, you don't think about it. Think about talking along, walking along that same pathway, but now you're on a cliff walk, you know, somewhere where you could potentially, if you, if you aren't efficiently walking, you could fall and you could injure yourself. It immediately changes the way that you walk. And in fact, removing that sort of unconscious auto... Aren't we lucky that we're not outside at this moment? Um, so removing that sort of unconscious automatic element to, to any muscle motor activity makes it less good, so less efficient. So it's sort of... Um, that's what happens when you get a psychosomatic condition. It's like playing a sport. If anyone plays tennis or football or anything like that, the minute you start thinking about what you're doing, you actually probably will do it less well. It's when you can do it really automatically that it works well. So very often psychosomatic conditions are nothing to do with psychiatric illness, psychological trauma, or vulnerability. They're to do with something has forced you to pay attention to your body in a way that you would not normally that disrupts the sort of automatic unconscious controls of your body, and that makes everything less, work less well. So what happened in Havana, 2016, um, so most people will realize that the US Embassy in Havana was closed for years, um, but decades, and reopened amid some stress in 2016, and diplomats were housed in the embassy there for the first time in a long time. So you can imagine a, a slightly tense situation. December 2016, a, a, dip, a member of diplomatic staff in the US Embassy in Cuba um, woke up in the middle of the night, heard a loud piercing sa sound. They didn't recognize it, it was unpleasant. And along with that, they developed a bunch of symptoms like dizziness, hearing impairment, headache, um, difficulty concentrating, a variety of different kind of non-specific symptom. For whatever reason, they thought, well, this sound has caused these symptoms, and somewhere in December 2016 arose the theory that a sonic weapon had been used to attack a diplomat from the U.S. Embassy in Cuba. Once the, the, it was very salient, it was very realistic for diplomats in Cuba to think they could be attacked or there could be surveillance, so it was not, an, you know, that stuff happens in that world, so it wasn't, it wasn't a ridiculous thought. Um, but it started the rumor that, that U.S. embassy staff were being attacked by sonic weapons. And by the end of 2017, I've forgotten the exact numbers, but I think it was about um, 17 people believed from the U.S. embassy and Canadian embassy in Havana thought that they had been attacked by a sonic weapon because they heard a sound and then shortly after started getting these sort of head-related symptoms like hearing loss. And now we've got a real problem here, which is that sound doesn't damage the brain. It doesn't matter, you know, maybe someone was attacked by something, but a sonic weapon, maybe a sonic weapon has never been known to exist, but let's assume that we in this room don't know all the weapons in existence and that there is such a thing as a, a sound weapon. Um, we still have an issue because sound doesn't damage the brain. It's a kind of a folk illness belief. It's like because I think people believe because sound goes in through your ears that it has some sort of direct access to your brain. But sound gets to your brain along nerve ways the same way that touch <coughs> does and so forth. So it's impossible for sound to damage the brain. It's also, these people were attacked in hotels with lots of other people around them and this kind of concept that you can direct a sound directly at someone and not only damage just them, but also specifically just damage their brain. I could go on endlessly as to why it's biologically impossible, but it 
felt salient to the people because they could be under surveillance, they could be being attacked. And it made sense in terms of a folk illness. Sound goes through your ears to your brain, so why shouldn't it damage your brain? So people really believe it, believe it to the point that senior politicians to this day still believe that sonic weapons attacks are happening. And if you follow, if, if you, you probably have seen it in the news recently, it's left, it's left Havana, and now there are supposedly sonic weapon attacks on people all over the world. US diplomats in Camilla Harris, was, Kamala Harris was stopped from going to Vietnam because someone in Vietnam thought they'd been attacked by a sonic weapon. I mean, I think it's very clear what happened, and I think most doctors who deal with the sort of things I deal with would say they knew what happened also. So someone associates a sound with brain injury, and all the staff in the embassy, and this is written about, so this is not my speculation, are called to um, meetings, and they're told that they're under attack from a sonic weapon, and that if they hear a sound, they should hide behind a wall, or if they hear anything they don't recognize, they should kind of try and um, get to seek cover somewhere. And people, anyone who has any symptoms they can't explain are asked to go to their doctor. Um, the rumors continue and it gets worse. Then they're called to a room and they're told, even if you don't think you have symptoms, you should go to your doctor and check you haven't been attacked by a sonic weapon. So what you've created now is an atmosphere in which you are telling people, search your bodies for symptoms. You know, and the minute you start searching your bodies for symptoms, you find it. So if even for a moment you start thinking about your hand, as I'm thinking about my hand now, I can feel tingling in my hand. That tingling's always been there, but my, my brain filters it out because it knows it's not important. Um, but if someone gives that importance, if someone says, hey, you're being attacked by a weapon and now you need to think about your body in a different way, it's a bit like, listen, how many of us in the COVID pandemic thought we had COVID 10 times and tested ourselves repeatedly? And, and I took my temperature about 10 times a day for the first like three weeks of March 2020 convinced every time I had a temperature, and I had a temperature zero times out of every test. And that's essentially what's happened to the US Embassy staff in, in Cuba. They have been um, forced to examine their bodies in such minute detail um, that, you know, of course they're going to notice things. But the really, really scary thing for me is what Philippa mentioned at the beginning, is people have been saying, listen, this is probably a psychosomatic phenomenon for all the reasons I'm saying. And what their doctors said to them was, or said to everyone else about them, was this cannot be a psychosomatic phenomenon because these people are really sick. They're not pretending, they're not acting, they're not malingering, they want to be in work. So what these doctors were actually saying to their patients was, either you're pretending, acting, faking, and there's nothing wrong with you, or you've been attacked by a sonic weapon. And as bloody ridiculous as the sonic weapon was, they knew they weren't pretending, faking, acting, and pretending, and all that stuff, which left them with only one option, a sonic weapon attack. And here we are now, five years later, still looking for the bloody sonic weapon, when they could have just been taught to think about their bodies differently if they had just been allowed by their doctors to even consider this other possibility, it could have alleviated so much suffering. The other aspect you talk about in, in a number of the, the different cases that you went to talk to people and, and look at is that these mystery illnesses mm. um, achieve something for the people who mm. are suffering from them that otherwise wouldn't be yeah. achieved. And they almost become like uh, the person telling their story, yeah. but writ large through their, yeah. their body and how their body is behaving. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about yeah. that? Because I really went into this, sort of not because my first book was about psychosomatic illness, but in a different sort of perspective, more about my own patients and my own learning about how to, how to sort of understand these things better and deal with them better. Um, and when I wrote that first book, and certainly when I started this book, I had this sort of terribly naive idea that these are illnesses, and if, you, if one just understood how one's body reacted in certain situations, one, one could eradicate these things. And I came to realize, as I was listening to these communities, that it's not so simple as to say these are illnesses. For some people, they're illnesses. And for some people, they're a really sophisticated way of working through a problem, or asking for help, or taking a break, and that they're actually serving a really important purpose for people or communities, and aren't necessarily, therefore, 
it's not necessarily therefore the case that they should be eradicated, but listened to instead. So this amazing community called the, the Mosquito people, and they're from the Mosquito Coast of Nicaragua. They're the indigenous people of Nicaragua. There's only a very small number of indigenous people left in Nicaragua. Um, and the mosquito people have this disorder, it's called a culture band syndrome, which means it's restricted to just their culture, just to the mosquito people. And it manifests as sort of um, running manically and then falling on the ground and having very violent seizures. And it's contagious, it tends to affect groups of young women in particular. And greasy sickness is, is the name for it in mosquito, um, but that actually translates literally into crazy sickness. And so they behave in a crazy manner. And um, when you hear about it first, and they attribute it to a thing called the duende, which is an evil spirit. So the people hallucinate an evil spirit, the evil spirit possesses them or infects them, and then they develop this, um, these seizures. Now, when I heard about this first, it all sounded a bit sort of, you know, I actually once used the word superstition in relation to it. But actually, when I came to understand it more, uh, talked to an anthropologist who studied it extensively, it's actually this incredibly sophisticated language of distress used by people of the mosquito community to say that they need help, that they're distressed, that something isn't right, but without the need to be explicit about what the problem is. So, you know, you don't have to, you just, it's like a way of asking for help without having to have the uncomfortable, unpleasant conversations or socially awkward situations. You can just say, listen, I'm in distress. This is how it's manifesting. And what it does is it elicits a community response. So when the young women get this greasy sickness thing, the community comes together and supports them. And they, you know, which is the exact opposite of what happens. I see people with similar seizures with different attributions. The exact opposite happens. You become isolated and you get stuck in your house and people look at you strangely. But in the greasy, in greasy sickness happens, the community rally together to support the person and treat them with ritual and they get better. And I came to realize it's actually this incredibly sophisticated mechanism for just getting help. Um, without having to sort of, um, and getting community support without having to be explicit about what the problem is. And then of course I realized, well, you know, these young women in, in Sweden with resignation syndrome, as it's called, the sleeping children, you know, the, theirs is a language of distress. You know, theirs is a language, you know, the world doesn't have a lot of sympathy for young asylum seeking children just saying that they feel stressed, but here's a much more powerful way for subjugated people to get their point across, basically. So I think that sometimes now I feel that some of these disorders serve a very important either personal purpose for individuals, because they allow them to make a change to their lives without having to sort of um, justify it um, in other ways, and also useful for communities to be heard. I was really interested in what you said about um, uh, ritualized spiritual and symbolic yeah. treatments yeah. working, and also the the difference between how these, uh, particularly with the community you've just discussed, mm. how they handle it and how yeah. Western medicine tends to yeah. compartmentalize different symptoms into being yeah. about different things. How could we learn from the ritualistic, yeah. spiritual and symbolic treatments yeah. in a much more classification orientated? I mean, that's because uh, that was a challenge for me because I feel I'm in a church. Are you allowed to say you're an atheist when you're in a church? I don't know, but well, nothing bad happened, maybe later. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't believe in, in, in spiritual things really or, you know, and yet I was meeting these communities. I'll tell you what happens to people with the kind of seizures that are of greasy sickness if you're in the UK, is basically you'll have brain scans and blood tests, and then when everyone decides that it's more likely to have a psychosomatic cause, you'll be referred to a psychologist or a psychiatrist. And you know how often that makes people better is actually only 30% of the time. So 70% of people with the kind of seizures that have a, a psychological cause um, in this country don't get better, very hard to treat. 100% of people with greasy sickness get better, and they're treated with ritualized sort of treatment. They're doused in um, water that has herbs and stuff in it, and, and there's a, a traditional healer. 
Um, and it was the same traveling around the world. You know, if, if you were subjected to Western medical approaches for these problems, you, had a less, you were less likely to get better. Or if you attributed the cause to something, you know, chemicals in your brain, etc., you were less likely to get better. But if you were able to have more of a holistic um, explanation that often involving things like external things, it could be spirits and things like that, you got better. Um, and I think that, um, you know, there are two key elements. Is one is, is the community response and the support that people got. So in the medicalized formulations, people were kind of hidden away in their houses and everything was kind of internal and therefore fatalistic and static and there was nothing they could do about it. Whereas in the more community, um, in the communities where they rallied around and supported each other, um, there was a lot less blame. It wasn't about something internal to you that was the problem. It was something external and the community coming together helped you. But I think the other thing that would help is, is for us as doctors to do a better job of following the sort of narrative to the conclusion. You know, so there's a community of people in Kazakhstan who believe they were being poisoned um, causing them to fall asleep. And the solution to the problem was that to move away from the area where they were being poisoned to another area, which was something that probably needed to happen all along, but that this um, poisoning had come to offer a social solution to them. So sometimes as doctors, what you want to go is, you want to go, there's no sonic weapon, there's no poison, there's no... But sometimes actually the solution is not to be confrontational in that way, but to try and understand what the person's underlying real concern is and listen to the story and follow it to what they believe the conclusion should be within reason, obviously. Um, I think we, we as doctors need to, to work a little better with the sort of formulations that our patients are using and follow their formulation to a conclusion if it is a reasonable one, rather than getting into sort of doing millions and millions of scans and, and telling people that they're wrong. You know, working together would probably be more successful. You talked a lot, um, coming off that, you talked, well, not a lot, but it came up repeatedly in, in some of the stories mm. you were sharing about people who were ostensibly expert yeah. and ostensibly there to help, yeah. who came in and, as far as I could see mm. from what you were describing, imposed an agenda yeah. of their own on yeah. these, these illnesses? Well, I think, um, I mean, there was one particular story in South America. There's um, a group, uh, in, it's a real classical story of mass hysteria, although it's usually, this type is usually gone in a, in a flash. Um, in a school one day, overheated school, windows wouldn't open um, in Colombia, so a kind of a hot environment um, in the hottest part of the year. A, a, a girl collapsed, she probably fainted, and then the whole, a whole bunch of girls in the same class collapsed. So that's sort of classical story of mass hysteria, and it's just, you know, when one person faints, it, it's actually quite contagious. Um, other people will faint just through hyperventilating and fright and other people through psychological mechanisms. But what happened in this school was that it didn't just stay in one class, it started spreading from class to class and then from school to school. And I visited the town because those sort of outbreaks are usually like a flash in the pan. We've had them in the UK, they come and go, um, someone collapses at a, a, a sort of Remembrance Day celebration, everyone collapses and the next day they're all fine again. But in this town it was going on a year and a half later. And uh, I didn't really know before I went there why it was still going on. And then I went and I discovered that once the news of this mass hysteria outbreak had come out, I would just call them pariahs, descended on the town and started telling them why they thought it was happening. And they blamed it on vaccinations. They said the girls were now having seizures because they all got the HPV vaccination. And I was encountering that around the world, upstate New York, bunch of girls again got, um, had seizures and tick like Tourette's and there to my absolute amazement um, Aaron Brockovich came along and said that they'd all been poisoned. You know Aaron Brockovich who from the movie who, who under she discovered that um, a, a, a small town was being poisoned by a plant called Hinkley I think and um, so she, she's now become off the back of that movie an expert in poisonings or mass poisonings or whatever. Um, so when she heard there was a bunch of people collapsed in upstate New York, she came in and said, oh, well, there was a train crash in this town and chemicals went into the soil and I think all these girls have been um, 
been poisoned by a chemical. It's a bit like a, a rumor of a sonic weapon. I mean, what do you do when someone comes along who's supposedly an expert and they're on television telling you that poison is, is soaking through the soil of your town? And, and it, again, it was as mad as a sonic weapon because th the outbreak of seizures in this town happened. I've now forgotten the year because it gets all so confusing. I think it was 2012. Um, the train catch happened in 1971. I mean, she must have had to go a long way back to find that sort of a, something to blame these seizures on. But the minute you blame, the minute you start blaming those sort of things, it's very hard to undo. Fortunately, that one was undone. But in South America, those schoolgirls are still having seizures nearly 10 years later. So just to make clear that I am not making an equivalency in the next question yeah, I'm about to ask, but how, how then do you feel about your role going yeah. in as a, a doctor who is researching yeah. but also writing about yeah. these cases? And how do you think your presence affects? Yeah. No, I don't disagree if you do, <laughs> um, because, I mean, I was very conflicted about all of this because... First of all, I was conflicted because this is not a role I'm usually in. You know, my role is usually, you know, I sit in my office and people come to see me because I'm supposed to provide a diagnosis or a treatment. Um, so I was really uncomfortable. Def I mean, the first time when I went and visited the young people in Sweden, you know, I knew I wasn't their doctor and I was just, it was deeply, deeply uncomfortable actually because I didn't really know I didn't know exactly, like, is it okay to be here if I'm not actually giving something? And also, it was very hard to, to not. I went to South America, and I met all these young women who have seizures. Seizures are my specialty. I, you know, I, I know what seizures are without tests, because I've seen so many of them. You know, but ha I'm not their doctors. You, how do you hold back from, from over-intervening? Um, and, and yes, that was incredibly difficult. Mm. And I'm still conflicted about it. That's the truth of the matter. Is, you know, because especially when you think a lot of these communities thought they were being poisoned and things like that, and I clearly didn't agree. Um, so you know, I was having to be very honest with them that I wasn't necessarily going to say I agreed with... I wasn't going to write this town is being poisoned, or this town is being attacked by this, that, or the other. Um, I still don't honestly know whether I've done the right thing. I honestly don't, but I kind of thought, well, you tell the story in their work. What I tried to do to resolve my own conflict was um, tell their, their stories in their words, mm -hmm. ask them what they wanted to say, ask them what they wanted understood. And clearly, I would have to give my own point of view. But I hope, I just hope that I sort of represented their point of view as well as my own. Um, but yes, I still don't quite, I'm still not completely sure that I've always done the right thing here, yeah. I think the care that you take with it and the thought mm -hmm. that has gone into that really, it really sings in the book. It, you mm -hmm. are very, very careful about what well. you present and how you present it. Um, I'm then interested, so much of this is about story, mm -hmm. right? And so much of this is about um, as you describe it, is mm -hmm. about people having the opportunity to tell their own story and mm -hmm. be listened to mm -hmm. um, and, and their voices be heard. Mm -hmm. You occupy a really interesting space, and this is why I mentioned your creative mm -hmm. writing qualification mm -hmm. right at the beginning. That space between doctor and writer, yeah. how does your practice as a, a, mm -hmm. as a writer come into your practice as a doctor? Yeah, I mean, I think it informs it, you know, mm. in terms of sort of, um, first of all, I do try to keep the two things as separate as possible mm. because um, it's, it is tricky. But um, I think that as, as a writer, you know, listening to these, I travel around the world listening to these people's stories and I think it really sort of, I understood, you don't always in the NHS have the time to hear the stories in the way that these people are telling the stories. You know, I get quite a lot of time, my patients, like, we, I can have 40 minutes or something, a GP has five minutes or 10 minutes, and um, so I'm in a luxurious situation, but you don't have the time that I spent mm. with all of these people. You know, I could spend as long as I wanted with any of these people. Um, and I, I, I think that, you know, I really understand how listening to the story and understanding the other person's perspective is, is so incredibly important because you might not agree with it, but often people's illnesses are kind of an embodiment of their own narrative. 
you know, if you believe that you're being attacked by a sonic weapon and you sort of embody that belief to the point that you start exhibiting the symptoms that you think going along with it, then if you don't understand the person's thought process from beginning to end, you'll never be able to tease out why they have each individual symptom. You know, it's all based on the Im imagery you have going along with the sonic weapon. But m medical practice doesn't really allow doctors to do that, really. Um, we don't get the time to, we have to just go, please can you list my symptom or your symptoms and please can you, you know, answer yes, no to these questions as quickly as possible because we don't have that much time. So I sort of, you know, I realize the importance of the story mm. and I do try and work with it a bit more with my patients, but it's quite difficult in the NHS mm. to put that into practice because, you know, time is of the essence very often, yeah. Yeah, it's a very tricky thing. It's interesting. I, I, have, I work on a project looking at uh, digital storytelling and mm. how that works. <laughs> Um, and it's a, it's a fascinating and challenging problem getting mm. patient voice yeah. into medical history even yeah. and having, having that story carried forward. Um, the other thing that really interested me reading this through is how particularly many of these illnesses manifest mm. in communities of young women. Mm -hmm. And language is so important, how you talk about this where, everywhere in the book. Yeah. Lang it becomes down to how we talk about things and how we um, imagine them through words. Where do you feel, or what do you feel about how young women are characterized with yeah. these illnesses? And that sort of, there's one chapter that's, uh, they're labeled as witches. Mm, yeah, I mean, it's, it was really quite disturbing. I mean, it's always been an issue. If, often again, if you, if you look at, at, in the media for people who, who aren't medically qualified who deal with these disorders, you will often find that people say, well, psychosomatic conditions are used as a way of dismissing women. So it's like if you come to me with a pain in your chest and you're a young woman, I'll dismiss you as psychosomatic. That is very much not how it is, okay? Young women are more likely to get psychosomatic conditions, and I don't know why it is, but I'll speculate about it in a moment. It is just simply a fact that this is an illness which is slightly more predominant in women. But I do believe there is an element of women being dismissed in this, but not because the illness is a dismissal, but rather it is being dismissed because it, it affects young women in particular. So I think, you know, if you've got this illness that people don't understand that predominantly affects young women, um, I think that has made it much easier for the medical community to just say, well, you know, it's not, it's not as important as other kinds of medical problems. So I think the dismissal here really is because it's a female predominant condition rather than, than the way it's portrayed as being um, women are dismissed with it. And that was really made very obvious to me when I was visiting these different communities. So there was quite a few peop groups where young women, South America, New York, um, and some other sort of uh, uh, Guyana, so there was a few places where these were was either exclusively women, young women, teenagers, or almost entirely um, young women. And then there were groups like, say, the diplomats, who were sort of much older, and some of them were men, Kazakhstan, again, much older, and, and a mixture of men and women. If you look at communities like the diplomats or the people in Kazakhstan, you know, pretty much nobody says anything terribly insultingly personal about them in terms of their sexuality or their sort of parents or stuff. If you look at these young groups of women, in South America, people said things like, um, you know, they just need a husband, they need, to, they need more sex, they need less sex, they've been traumatized by the history of the country. It was all about fragility, sexuality, and it was the tone of the conversation was extremely insulting. You know, nobody said about the diplomats in Havana, you know, she just needs to get a, or he just needs to get a wife, or he just needs a good shagging, or whatever. Kind of, you know, there was not, that sort of kind of thing was just not talked about when it came to older groups and, and men. Um, the girls in upstate New York, one newspaper headline called them the witches of Leroy. Like, imagine saying that about the diplomats in Havana. You wouldn't dream of it. But because they're teenage girls, that sort of thing was considered acceptable. And also the media picked over their lives and said things like, oh, you know, her parents are divorced or, you know, that sort of thing. You know, listen, 
If you look at any group of people, somebody's parents will be divorced and somebody will have had a traumatic childhood. But it was only really talked about in that disparaging way when it came to the young women. And the older groups, they pretty much said, listen, these people cannot have a psychosomatic disorder because they're older. And they also, and they just didn't talk about it, they rejected it, but they certainly didn't pick over the lives in that way. So it was quite disturbing actually to see how the young women were talked about and treated. And it was very obvious why they all completely rejected the psychosomatic formulation. Because why wouldn't you, if, if being, having a psychosomatic condition has all these negative connotations going with it? So I think the press actually has a lot to answer, you know, because the minute they talk about hysteria, they start talking about witches and, you know, laughing, epide epi laughing epidemics in Tanganyika in, you know, hundreds of years ago or dancing plagues from hundreds of years ago. There's no other medical problem where if you get it today, you'll be compared with some ancient belief from like 300 years ago. And it's not a fair comparison and it pushes these young women into having to defend themselves. And if you have to prove that you're really sick, you're much less likely to get better. Yeah, it's very disturbing. It is very disturbing. You, you talked about the understanding, obviously, mm. for specialists like yourself, the understanding is there, the knowledge is there, you know what it is you're dealing mm. with. You talked perhaps about stepping, if I understood correctly, mm. and correct me if I got this wrong, slightly further into the medical profession, mm. perhaps the understanding isn't as deep in that sort mm. of um, duality of mind and body still mm. is, is used a lot. And then when you get as far as the public, that understanding of what these illnesses are is, is almost totally yeah. missing. Yeah. So what can we change? How can we talk about this better? How can we... Yeah. Well, actually, it is already changing. And I have to say, if you live in the UK and, and Scotland, um, particularly, actually, there are lots of doctors interested in these conditions now. And um, so it's already changing. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but... Basically, the way doctors are trained needs to change because when you're in medical school, you're taught about sort of, you know, diseases, obviously. But, you know, my nephew's a recently qualified doctor. When he was in medical school, you know, he would say, well, I would say, what did you learn today or <laughs> whatever? He said, you know, memory impairment, you know, they, dementia or something about memory impairment. And, and you'd say, well, what are the differentials? What are the causes of this? You know, and... You know, a huge percentage of people who go to a clinic because they have memory impairment, it's actually more of a kind of psychosocial problem because if you're not concentrating on things, you don't take information in, you don't remember it, so it's a really common cause of memory impairment. Not even mentioned. You know, these things are not even considered important enough to be mentioned in, in medical schools. So I think we really need to sort of um, improve training, although I have to say now in, in the UK it really has improved, but I'm not sure that's... In, in, holds true around the world. But we also, as a community, need to elevate these conditions in our, in our sort of... Um, when we think about diseases, I think people think, well, you know, if, if you came in with a, to see me with a, a, a weak foot and, and I said, well, it could be a, a trapped nerve in your back or it could be a muscle problem or whatever, that's, uh, that's not a very good differential. But the idea is that you've got two different disease processes could be causing this. You, you'd be quite happy to, you know, I wasn't completely sure, but you've got two explanations, we're gonna look into it, and then when I, you're hoping you'll have the lesser of the two. Um, but what happens with psychosomatic conditions is we keep it as a bit of a secret until like, it could be this, this, or this, maybe you have epilepsy and I investigate you for that for a year. And then I finally go, you don't have epilepsy, you've got a psychosomatic condition, well, I mean, that speaks volumes to the patient. It says, I'm, I, I am, was withholding this for some reason because um, I think it's less important, or it says that I'm only giving you this diagnosis because I couldn't find anything else. And we need to understand this condition is actually, these conditions are really common, and we need to think about them at the beginning of a medical journey and not as a dismissal at the end of the journey because that really sort of... Um, makes it hard for people to accept. But of course the overarching thing is if, if everyone understood that these conditions are just as serious as any other condition, you'd have no reason to rail against it. If having a seizure for, due to epilepsy and having a seizure during, due to, for psychosomatic reasons were considered to be equals, then you would just want to know the real answer, which is it? What's happening at the moment is it's like epilepsy is a serious disease, and, but 
at least I understand what's wrong with me and I'm, I will get respect from people when I explain what's wrong with me versus how the hell does this happen and people will laugh at me and think I'm putting it on. Well, why wouldn't you want the epilepsy diagnosis? So we need to elevate these diagnoses so they're equal standing so we can think about them equally at the beginning. I was really struck by the story of your patient who... Um, her, what she had been told about what a slip mm. disc could do was mm. so powerful yeah. that um, she manifested more and more and more extreme symptoms yeah. to the point that she uh, was having to use a wheelchair. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's so common. It mm. is so common. So we embody medical diagnoses. So if someone, you know, again, COVID's a good, a good example. You know, if someone says you might have COVID, you think, well... You're checking your taste and smell, and then you're checking your throat, and then you're checking your breathing. And unfortunately, you know, the minute you start paying attention to these things, you notice things. So this particular young woman, you know, she had back pain, you know, probably pulled a muscle in her back, quite a common thing. Um, and a scan, tests are terribly dangerous. Doctors need to be more thoughtful about the way they do tests, because you know what? We didn't even have MRI scans 30 years ago when I qualified in medicine. Um, so we didn't actually know what the inside of the body looked like in any kind of detail. So now you're having a scan. When I qualified in medicine, that scan didn't even exist. And now we're actually scanning people and we can see things we never saw before. And the minute we see those things, and we're all different on the outside, and I can guarantee you we're all different on the inside mm -hmm. as well. So we're going to, if we scanned everyone in the room, we'd find all sorts of little things that... Quite frankly, some people would be able to dismiss and other people would go, what the hell is that? Do I have to live with that unexploded bomb inside me? And that's what happened to this young woman. She got, had a scan. It showed a very minor slip disc in her back, which a doctor you know, wouldn't consider important. It wasn't pressing on anything important. But in her head it was. And she had this very rich, vivid imagery of every time she moved, the, the disc was moving with her and was edging closer to her spine. And that caused her to sort of start paying attention to her legs because she believed the disc now had moved and was pressing on her spine. And um, the more she paid attention to her legs, the less automatic and the less natural they felt. And this was a really slow, progressive process until she ended up in a wheelchair. And that's the, that's the, um, that is the fundamental process for many psychosomatic disorders. They're not about, you know, and, and it was a problem for her, they're not about childhood trauma, unhappy marriages, stressful jobs. They're about the sort of embodied narrative of, of, of your beliefs about how body work, how bodies work, and something has happened to trigger you to think about your body differently and make it work differently. So she sort of, she was referred to a psychologist who asked her about her upbringing and she just thought, I'm in a wheelchair, why are you asking me about my upbringing? She rejected it. What she actually needed was to learn how to trust her body again with a physio physiotherapist. She needed the automatic quality of movement to come back. And that can actually be done with simple things like learning to walk to music, for example. Things that return the sort of, the, that unconscious rhythm of, of the art of movement can actually get you back walking more effectively than psychoanalysis and things. That's not to say that for some people, psychosomatic disorders are to do with psychological trauma. I'm just saying they're not always. Mm. So, we've talked for a, a while. I am hoping that there are people in the audience with uh, burning questions that they're ready to ask, and also people who are watching online. Um, please drop any questions into the chat, and I'll try and ask them. So, this, this is where I turn a little bit school marmy. I apologize. There are two mics um, and two lovely people who will be bringing them around. If you want to ask a question, if you could put your hand up, and I will sort of indicate people to go to, if you could wait until you have the mic in your hand or in front of your face, please, so that everybody can hear, and please keep your masks on. Let's... Yes, please, Roger. As a neurologist, what are your views on long COVID? Sorry, could you say again? As a neurologist, what are your views on long COVID? On what? On non, what are your views on non, long COVID or long COVID? Yeah. Long COVID. I mean, I think that long COVID is just now being used as a blanket term for a whole bunch of situations. I worked in intensive care during the pandemic, and I guarantee you anyone who survived that experience will have long-term symptoms. There's also um, 
undoubtedly people who suffer viral infection who get post-viral um, fatigue, which is certainly something that is well recognized with lots of viral infections. However, I have no doubt there's also a reasonable percentage of people who've been drawn into this concept of long COVID in the same way that these other people I've talked about through examining our bodies for symptoms. If you look at the symptoms for long COVID now, I mean, this, I, I've stopped looking, but the last time I looked, it was something like 200 things could qualify you for having long COVID, which means that everyone potentially could have it, you know? So it's, I think that um, there is un unequivocally a percentage of people with long COVID where the problem is more to do with the psychosocial impact of being in a pandemic than actually contracting the virus. The difficulty we have now though is everyone, people who are in hospital in ITU are being considered in the same bracket as people who didn't even test positive and I think we need to divide these things out to understand them better. Could we have this person here and then Roger, there's someone halfway down. Thank you. Thank you. I find this completely fascinating. I think it's been a totally fascinating talk. Um, and I just wondered, I, I was puzzled about your um, uh, uh, statistics of only 30% in the West um, um, actually being helped and recovering, uh, having seen a psychologist or a yeah. psychiatrist, compared with the mosquito people yeah. who where it was a, more like 100%. And I find that really uh, interesting in itself. Um, I mean, there's, mass, there's the mass hysteria element, obviously, but I was just thinking about, you know, if somebody's um, distress is so uncontainable because it's so great and it gets projected into the body um, in order to be helped or looked after or to give a reason for it in some way, whether um, there have been any um, research done on more intensive um, psychotherapy rather than just a psychiatrist mm. or psychologist, mm. a, a intensive psychotherapy with some of these patients because of more deep-seated um, uh, mm. reasons behind the yeah. symptoms. I mean, as a, you know, so yeah, so again, I think you understood, but just so everyone understands, when I said only 30% of people get better, I was specifically talking about these, dis what we call dissociative seizures, hysterical seizures. Um, or seizures for psychosomatic reasons. Yeah, so the recovery rate's about 30%. There's no, um, there's no study to look at the deeper kind of, because that's not available in the NHS. So there's actually very few. Tr so for, for these sort of psychosomatic seizures that I deal with, the only treatment that has ever been looked at kind of in a double blind sort of randomized trial um, has been cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. Um, but, you know, we don't have access to um, people, I cannot refer my patients for sort of prolonged kind of um, psychological therapies. Um, and I've absolutely no doubt, so a percentage of people with these kind of seizures will have suffered significant psychosocial problems, abuses, et cetera, in the past, unequivocally. And, you know, I'm sure that that sort of treatment would be successful. But I think it's important to say that a percentage have not, a little like Tara with her injured back, um, or the, so the lady I was talking about with the injured back who, 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 who um, became paralyzed, not everyone needs that kind of therapy either. So I think it has to be super individualized because a lot of the patients I see, what actually happened to them, the very first thing is they fainted on the underground and then they woke up and they're surrounded by someone and a first aider told them they had a seizure. And then they're terrified because there's bunches of strangers looming over them and someone stole their mobile phone and somebody else videoed them and then they're whisked away to a casualty department. Can you imagine how frightening that experience is? And then you have to get up the next day and get in the tube again. Um, and that can be sort of the beginning of a cascade of the way people change this, the relationship with their bodies. So if you get someone like that, then they need something simpler, like perhaps cognitive behavioral therapy. So I think what it requires is that these, um, I see a, a extreme nod, a shaking of the head there, but um, there is um, basically uh, the point being that these things happen through different mechanisms. So they're individualized, but we don't have good randomized control trials for different forms of treatment.
Um, when you spoke about the girls in Colombia, um, as it's, uh, the seizures pass from classroom to classroom to schools, mm. I think you said it, the symptoms were still there 10 years later. Yeah. H had that stayed with the same cohort of girls or had it kind of passed into no, the community? No, it's passed from, yeah. So, I mean, some girls have recovered. So, so basically, it started in one school and it spread from school to school and um, in a kind of confined uh, area. Um, some girls recovered, some girls became chronically ill, and there are still some new schools being affected. But when I went and visited that town, I met girls who had recovered, and they said to me, well, I'm, you know, I'm now, I've left school and I've gone to college, because it's quite a few years later, and I'd say to them, well, that's brilliant, you know, you're, you're well, that's great. Congratulations, and they would say, but I know the poison is still inside me, and I know I'm not really better. So even the people who'd recovered, now obviously only met a small selection, this affected thousands of girls, I met a small selection, but even though, so I'm sure there are people who did move on, but even the ones who had recovered believed that they still had a poison inside their body that would give them cancer later or something terrible would happen. But yeah, some people got better, yeah, certainly there, I'm sure, and I think I was probably meeting the people who didn't get better or believed they weren't better. I wasn't really meeting the ones probably who put this all behind them. But the concept of there being a poison inside their bodies was so strong that some people simply couldn't put it behind them. But I think others could, I'm sure. Has it limited the take-up of the HPV Oh, vaccine? yeah, no, it's caused huge problems with the HPV vaccine in this area mm. um, because, you know, people really have been a lot of outsiders from the US and other countries went to this little town and told them that all over the world people were dying of HPV vaccine and you know these for, for many social reasons the community perhaps had reason to believe people who come from the USA more than their local doctors. Their local doctors were talking a lot of sense but they didn't quite know who to believe so it's pretty awful. I think we have time for one more quite focused question and yeah. answer. Okay, that was, a, that was a message for me, not for you. <laughs> <laughs> Subtle. Hi, well, this is actually quite a quick question. Um, so it's your third book. Do you think of yourself um, still as a doctor first and then as a writer? Oh, yeah, second? no, I don't. I can't even think of myself as a writer. After the first book, I thought, when will I think of myself as a writer? And I said to myself, I'll think of myself as a writer in part, always a doctor first, but after the third book, but I've now written the third book and it's going to have to be the fourth book because it's just, yeah, but I work full time for the NHS. This is a very small part of what I do, yeah. I am going to draw us to a close there. I hope you have all enjoyed this as much as I had. This has been fascinating. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thanks um, so c for coming, by the way, because with the sort of COVID and the weather and everything, I'm slightly worried we would be on our own. But so it's we thought, so we nice. thought we were just Thank going to be chatting so in a big empty this church. It's really this nice to have people here. Thank um, you. Suzanne will be doing book signings after this event, so I have one last little piece of housekeeping. Those that are wanting to come and get a book signed, if you could do so by going up the aisle to my left, your right. Um, if you are just wanting to leave and get on to your next event, if you could go up the other aisle and out of the door at the back, that would be fantastic. We're trying to keep everybody in a one-way system. Um, also, if you could give us a couple of minutes to de-mic, which is more of a faff than you would imagine, um, and Suzanne will be ready to sign books very quickly. The final thing to say is thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you for being a brilliant audience. Thank you to everyone who's watching online. And could you all join with me in showing Suzanne how much we have enjoyed ourselves today with a and really big round of applause. thanks to Philip as well. Thank you.